Just 57 per cent of people have had their second dose. In the short time that's available to me, Sandra I'm encouraging Smith, West Australians to get the jab. Resume your chair, and I'm sure we all echo those thoughts. Um, just before we start question time, or in starting question time, I did want to address a matter that uh, arose yesterday. Uh, I undertook to review the Hansard in relation to a point of order raised by Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, and come back to the Senate. In looking at this matter, I have also taken the opportunity to review the rulings and commentary of my predecessor on glancing references and comments made by ministers to other parties and their policies. For instance, on 10 December 2020, President Ryan said, I have ruled previously that a glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant. An answer that consisted of attacking the opposition or outlining their policy would not be directly relevant. On the 4th of February this year, he said, the question contained a number of loaded political phrases. The minister was, I would imagine, making a glancing observation as, and is entitled to some wide latitude to address the terms, assertions and imputations in the question. In other words, there is wider latitude for political response to politically loaded questions. This is consistent with the ruling of earlier presidents. On this basis, I do not think it was unreasonable to allow the minister to begin her answer the way she did. However, having reviewed the Hansard, I allowed the Leader of the Opposition uh, to bring the minister back to the question. That is something I should have done myself. We'll now go to questions. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I thank you for that statement uh, at the outset? My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Four years ago, Mr Morrison brought a lump of coal into the federal parliament, and in 2019 he claimed emissions reduction targets would wreck the economy. When did he change his mind? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for the question, albeit I don't accept the, uh, the premise of all aspects of, uh, of that question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, the government went uh, to the last election, as we have to previous elections, with commitments to emissions reductions targets. They weren't the same commitments as those opposite, that's true, just as we didn't have the same policies as those opposite. Uh, but we certainly went to the election with emissions reduction targets and indeed despite the fact that those opposite and others have always claimed that when we've outlined coalition policies to achieve those targets they've always said it will fail the targets won't be met the government's policies won't achieve it and guess what's happened on every single occasion of course we've actually exceeded the targets the policies have worked the policies have delivered the emissions reductions targets and that is what we continue to do, Mr President. It's what we continue to do in terms of delivering and achieving the 2030 emissions reductions targets, which we took to the last election, Mr President. Contrary to what Senator Wong said, the debate at the last election was about whether or not the Labor Party, with an increased target, had a plan, had a policy, had it costed, had any idea of how they were going to achieve it. The Coalition had outlined how we were going to achieve our targets, and I'm very pleased to say we're on track to meet those targets. Order. We're on track to exceed those targets. And in doing so, it helps to ensure that on a per person basis, Australia's reduction of emissions is indeed amongst some of the biggest in the world. On a per person basis, we're achieving close to a 50 per cent reduction in emissions. But even on an absolute basis in terms of the rate of emissions reductions, we are achieving faster rates of emissions reductions than Canada or Japan or New Zealand or the United States. I don't say that to criticise those nations, it's just a statement of what is occurring and a demonstration that despite the fact those opposite like to try to talk Australia down, like to try to be negative in some ways in relation to our achievements, our emissions Minister, are trending down Minister, and we continue to deliver policies to achieve that. Has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison has said electric vehicles would end the weekend uh, yeah. and suggested that batteries to store renewable energy were as useful as a big banana. When did he decide he was wrong? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, once again, we get the, uh, the selective quoting, the misrepresentation from, uh, from those opposite. Mr Morrison talking about Labor policies to mandate Labor policies. Senator Wong wants to, you know, wants to go and ask questions that are about comments made by the Prime Minister in relation to Labor policies obviously opens up scrutiny of Labor policies. Now, the Labor policies taken to the last election were about trying to mandate outcomes 
and to mandate outcomes that would have different impacts. Now, of course, technology moves on, time moves on, and as technology and time move on, we want to make sure that Australia is able to embrace the opportunities of the future, able to lead where we can in terms of the opportunities of the future. We're doing that through our investment in technology, not the type of taxes the Labor Party have proposed previously. Our investment is in making sure Australia can embrace the technologies that suit our nation, give our regions the Order. advantages to secure jobs and opportunities in the future while lowering Minister, emissions. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce have railed against climate action for over a decade. The Nationals are holding Mr Morrison to ransom, and Mr Morrison refu has refusing to take net zero by 2050 to the coalition party room. How can Australians possibly believe Mr Morrison's last-minute scramble to land a political deal on net zero by 2050, under two weeks out from, uh, from Glasgow, is real? Minister. Well, Mr President, Australians should absolutely have confidence that our government will deliver the policies we implement and that those policies will work for the future Order. on meeting the commitments Australia makes, because that's what we've done. That's Order what we've done left. time and time again. That's what we've done time and time again, Mr President. That when we said Order. we would achieve Australia's emission reductions targets, and here were the policy profiles that would do so, whilst abolishing Labor's carbon tax, we got on, we implemented those policies, and we've achieved those targets. And we've exceeded those targets. And that's what we're going to continue to do. That's why Australians should have faith. They can look at our track record. In fact, they should have the faith that our side of politics will achieve that without the types of policies those opposite have been known to embrace that drive up costs of electricity, that drive up costs for Australian businesses, that hurt Australian families, that risk Australian jobs. That's what Australians should fear in terms of the policies of those opposite, because they've shown a track record with those sorts of policies. We've shown a track record of being Minister, able to lower emissions, time, lower power Minister, prices, but increase the, the strength the of the Australian economy. Expired. Senator Chan order on my left. Senator Chandler. You have the call. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister provide an update on how Australia's vaccination rollout is progressing, particularly in our home state of Tasmania, and how the national plan is working to secure our COVID recovery so we can safely reopen and live with the virus? Minister representing the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Chandler, for your question. Uh, Mr President, yes, our home state certainly has something to celebrate by passing the first national plan milestone of 70 per cent double dose uh, in the last day. It's important, an important milestone, Mr President, uh, and of course the nation has also passed 70 per cent, Mr President, of vaccination post 16. Mr President, our nation continues to surge ahead, rolling up our sleeves with a total of 33,489,485 doses administered nationally as of last night, Mr President. 14.6 million Australians are now fully vaccinated, Mr President. That's 70.8 per cent of those over 16, 81.6 per cent of those over 50 and 86.6 per cent, Mr President, of those over 70. We know that the people over 70 are the most vulnerable cohort when it comes to COVID-19, Mr President, and we now have over 95 per cent of that population who have had at least one dose. Mr President, can I congratulate, Senator Ayers, Senator can I congratulate and commend those who have been instrumental in us achieving those targets so far? Our health care workers, our doctors, our pharmacists, our nurses, those in the state clinics who have all worked Order so hard, Mr. President, in over 9,200 uh, vaccine outlets around the country. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, we obviously need you to do Mr. more, Mr. President. Our national plan, agreed by national cabinet, is progressing just as we said it would. And yesterday, we reached the commencement of phase B, where we can start looking at lower restrictions and our country Order. opening up once again. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister what ha uh, outline what happens now that we have reached phase B of the rollout? Minister. Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I don't need to be a psychic, Senator Watt. We've actually reached phase B of the rollout. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we will start to see the country opening up, as we are in New South Wales and Victoria uh, and here in the ACT, Mr. President. Oh, uh, yeah. As the Prime Minister said in an, op an opinion piece that ran in Tasmania today, Senator each Ayers. and every vaccination, Mr. President, brings us closer Senator Green. to bringing our country back together again. And I join with Senator Smith in his urging of Western Australians to roll their sleeves up Senator and Keneally. get the vaccine, Mr. President, so we can join Western Australians in having a free country. Families and friends can get together, Mr. President. Businesses can get going again, Mr. President. Importantly, our small businesses can get back to work, firing up jobs. There can be a safe easing of border restrictions as the vaccination rates continue to surge Order. across Australia, Mr. President, and we can all start to take our lives back. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister advise what preparations the government has made for the rollout of a booster program? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. The, a, a booster program will give us a boost in protection to those who are fully vaccinated with their second dose, Mr. President. Of course, that's 70 per cent of the Australian population. At the moment, the plan is being progressed through the Australian Technical Advisory Group on uh, Immigration, ATAGI, and we expect Order. advice will be provided to the Health Minister in the Senator not Keneally. too distant future, Mr President. The government has been preparing for boosters Senator and secured 151 million doses for 22 and 23 to ensure all Australians can access a booster if it is recommended by the medical experts. Maintaining high levels of vaccination in our community will ensure we are protecting everyone, particularly those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19, including those, of course, in our loved ones in aged care, Mr President. We will be building on the strong foundation that we have already established through the vaccine rollout. Minister. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and leader of the National, Senator Mackenzie. I refer to the National Subcommittee consisting of Senator Mackenzie, Mr Littleproud, Little Mr Pitt and Mr Hogan, settling the National's election wish list for Mr Morrison in return for support of net zero by 2050. How much taxpayer money have the Nationals demanded Mr Morrison spend to gain their support for net zero by 2050? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Sheldon, for your question. Well, as we've been very, very clear as the second party of government, we are taking our time to carefully consider the proposition put forward by the Prime Minister uh, that Australia will be committing to net zero by 2050 Order, Senator Watt. in Glasgow. That is actually what rural and regional Australians sent us here to do, and we don't apologise for that. Now, I know, as Doug Cameron and I was privileged to serve with Doug Cameron uh, in this chamber for many years, made note of how your party processes operate, and that you are, you'd all had lobotomies, and you basically just do what your leader says, and you're a bunch of zombies, as I recall, direct quote in uh, Rabbit Ears. Senate in Minister, our political Minister, party... Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point on, of order. On, re on relevance, in light of your ruling, this question was very straight about the amount of money that, ta that uh, the Nationals have demanded. Uh, the Minister is veering off into exactly the kind of political attack that you said was not permitted. Uh, I, 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 there, were, there were two parts of, of um, my uh, presentation to the Senate, Senator Watt. I think you've uh, selectively quoted one of them, but uh, I will uh, bring the minister back to the question. Uh, I, um, I, uh, you have the call, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. And so the process that our political party has determined to undertake is to consult our colleagues to understand and appreciate their needs and concerns for the next 30 years, not for the next six months towards the election, and to then uh, put forward 
a document that Order. is based on the principles that will underpin the negotiations between the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister. We have been very, very clear. This is not about 10, 30 pieces of silver. This is not about um, some beads and some mirrors. This is actually about how do we secure and protect rural and regional Australians and our industries in a decarbonised future. That is about doing our job. And so I'm very proud to be part of a political party and part of a subcommittee that is actually focused on securing the regions in this proposed uh, future that the, the Prime Minister and the government is seeking to um, deliver. Now, if that actually can't Minister, come... Minister, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Have any Liberal members requested that the Nationals include particular items in their pre-election wish list to Mr Morrison? Minister. Well, I think um, we're always happy to talk to our Liberal colleagues about how the National Party can help them deliver on their needs and interests for their, for their communities. I mean, at the end of the day, we've been sent here to do one thing, and that is to stand up for our communities, and that is exactly what we're doing. So, you know, well, if, well, Senator Canavan, Senator Canavan, that uh, interjection wasn't was relevant, and so I'll take it. The issue was that what, who I haven't received submissions from is the Labor Party members for rural and regional Minister, Australia. Please, how we Minister, can actually assist Minister, them and assist their Minister, foresters. Please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Again, on relevance, Mr. President. A very straight question, no hyperbole. Have any Liberal members requested that the Nationals include particular items on the list they're providing to Mr Morrison? No hyperbole. This is a Sen it's a straight question. Senator Watt, I've allowed you to restate the question. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much. You know, there are a lot of uh, Liberal Party colleagues that are, have been concerned about what uh, a move towards uh, net zero by 2050 may mean for rural and regional communities. Order. Now they've made those. You've quoted those back to me in the chamber this week. It should not be a surprise to you. At Minister, all. please resume your seat. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. Will the minister guarantee the full details of any nationals agreement to support net zero by 2050 will be made public? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. What I will guarantee you, I, I won't be guaranteeing you, as uh, Senator Sheldon, to disclose what the National Party party room discusses. But what I will be able to guarantee you is that our party will never resile from Order, standing up Senator for the people Ed. that sent us here. And it is very, very sad to watch the party that used to Senator stand Gallagher. up for the working class in this country fall Senator over Ayers. in the face of the threat of the Greens in your inner city urban seats. And member after member, and other than Raf, uh, Senator Ciccone from Victoria, you are silent on water policy. You are silent on forestry and standing up for forestry workers. You are silent on food processes uh, and food manufacturing. You know what? What a joke you've become to the people that actually you were set up in Bolcolden, out in regional Queensland. And Minister, you, uh, your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services. Minister, this week is Anti-Poverty Week. Yesterday, former New South Wales Liberal Minister Prue Goward was condemned by anti-poverty organisations and advocates as being disturbing, abusive and inaccurate for saying out loud how Liberals like her view people trapped in poverty as huge cost centres, as an underclass of Australians who are neglectful parents and almost entirely lacking in discipline. Minister, as another Liberal minister, will you join me in condemning her appalling statements and abuse of some of the most vulnerable people in our community? Just, be just before I call the minister, interjections are always disorderly. 
but particularly during the asking of questions, if you uh, want everyone in the chamber, particularly me, to hear the question, then I do need some silence. Uh, the Minister for Families and Social Services, uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and um, I thank Senator Rice for her question. Um, in the absence of actually having um, seen the comments to which Senator Rice refers, um, I won't make any specific comment about that. But what I will say is that I take my responsibility as a Minister for Families and Social Services extremely seriously, and the absolute total focus of the activities of my office and my department are making sure that we support the most vulnerable people in Australia. Unquestionably, that is our single purpose and role. Now, whether that be through providing um, them with, uh, with payments, um, whether supporting them in, in working age payments, or whether that be um, through um, some of their uh, pension. Oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Relevant, even if the minister hasn't seen the questions I said that they were, and I asked, just asking her and condemning them. The, of the people trapped in poverty are huge cost centres, as an underclass of Australians with neglectful Senator, parents Senator Rice, and Senator almost Rice, entirely lacking Senator in discipline. Rice, I've given you the chance to repeat part of the question. I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. Minister, you have the call for a minute and 15 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I reiterate my initial comments. But um, you know, I am not going to make a comment about something that you're saying, um, uh, but I will absolutely guarantee to this chamber unequivocally that my absolute focus is making sure that the resources of my department and the resources that are provided by the taxpayers of Australia uh, to support vulnerable Australians, to make sure that we support them when they, are, uh, when they find themselves in situations, whether it be unemployed, whether it be when they're victims of domestic violence, um, you know, whether it be supporting the states and territories in their frontline service provision in the case of child protection and the like. I mean, absolute focus of my department is always to support the most vulnerable people in Order. our community. Um, and that is why we have always been so tremendously focused, not only on creating jobs, but actually working with Australians to get them uh, to get them out of unemployment. Because you know, you refer to Poverty Week, um, Senator Rice, and you know, one of the key things that has come out of many of the reports, some Order, this week Senator and Thorpe. others that have uh, have been released around this particular issue, is that we know that people who are on unemployment benefits do it way tougher than those people who've got a job. And that's why we spoke on getting them Minister, into work. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rice, order. Senator Rice, please resume your seat. I, I, I just asked for order in the chamber while questions were being asked. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. Minister, poverty is a political choice. Last year, your government increased income support during the lockdowns, but this year hundreds of thousands of people have lived, lived through lockdowns on payments below the poverty line, going without food, without medicines and at risk of homelessness. And the removal of COVID disaster payments means thousands more people are now joining them. Minister, do you agree that the job seeker rate of $44 a day is not enough to live on? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, Senator no, Thorpe. no government um, has done more to walk side by side to support Australians through this COVID pandemic. Um, we have supported Australians, whether it be um, through uh, increases in the, in the job seeker payment last year, whether it be through the the, uh, the, um, the COVID disaster payment that was administered through uh, Senator, Senator Thorpe. McKenzie's um, department to support those people in Australia who found themselves in lockdowns of recent times, whether it be the business supports that have been put in place. But we also understand that as a government we have a responsibility to maintain the sustainability of payments that are made. We have to make sure that we support people in a safety net. Apologies, Senator Rice. In Mr. President, point of order. The question was whether uh, the minister agreed that the job seeker uh, rate of forty-four dollars a day is not enough to live on. Relevance, relevance. She is not going to the the relevance of the question. Is forty-four dollars a day Rice, enough to live Senator on? Senator Rice, you've had another opportunity to restate part of the question. It was a very broad question. The minister was being directly relevant, Minister. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the, the obligation of governments is to make sure that these sorts of payments are sustainable into the future. We have to balance supporting people when they find themselves out of work, but also making sure that the incentive is there for them to go to work. That's why we create jobs, and that's why we are the government. Senator Rice, a second supplementary question. Minister, I've heard from many constituents who inadvertently received both Job Seeker and Job Keeper, and they're now being pursued for those debts. Minister, why are you going after people on income support, but not taking on the big corporations that profited with billions of dollars on JobKeeper? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, firstly, I would say um, that you know, we need to be very clear around the fact that um, any fraudulent activity in relation to any payments that are received, no matter who they are received by, whether they be by businesses or individuals, um, are always pursued by government because it is our obligation in this, as the custodians of taxpayers' funds to make sure that, uh, that people who have received something that they are not entitled, uh, that, that we pursue that. Um, I would also say um, that Order. we— that in, in making sure that we, uh, when we put these things in place, we were very, very clear uh, to make sure that people understood that if they were receiving JobKeeper, um, that they were required to uh, declare it as income. There is, I mean, if you go onto our website, that was very, very clear um, that you would that that was earnings, and you had to declare those earnings. But to your point, Senator Rice, we will pursue anybody who has received taxpayer funding when they have not been entitled Minister, to Minister, time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. And my, pre my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. The 2009 Defence White Paper foreshadowed increased tension in the region and announced the need to increase our submarine force from six to 12 submarines. The RAN was supposed to have 12 new submarines by 2039. Now that the smoke has dissipated, now that the mirrors have been removed, it is clear that under the new plan in 2039, we will instead have only five ageing Collins-class submarines. In October last year, the then DFAT Secretary, Secretary, Her Excellency Frances Addison, advised that the China-Taiwan situation concerned her more than any time in the last three and a half decades of her career. Why has the government left us so vulnerable with so few submarines under these circumstances? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. I thank Senator Patrick uh, for his question. And, uh, in acknowledging the number of points that uh, the Senator made, I would note firstly uh, that the government has clearly stated the fact is that Australia's st strategic environment uh, has deteriorated in ways that weren't anticipated even five years ago. Uh, we know that the Indo-Pacific uh, is now the global epicentre of strategic competition, and that's why the AUKUS agreement uh, between Australia, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States uh, is so important and so necessary. In terms of capability itself, we are delivering as a government on, the, on our commitment to deliver to our service women and men the equipment they need to keep us safe. And I can confirm in that context that defence spending under this government will rise above 2 per cent of GDP in the coming financial year. There are a number of additional capabilities in which we are investing, Senator Patrick, along with those uh, already planned that will address the potential security challenges uh, in the coming decades. We are extending the life of all six of our Collins-class submarines. All six submarines will undergo life of type extension within the budget of $4.3 to $6.4 billion, extending the life of each submarine by 10 years. We're also investi investing in advanced long-range strike capabilities, including Tomahawk's cruise missiles, long-range anti-ship missiles and joint air-to-surface standoff missiles. The Tomahawk cruise missiles will be fielded on our Hobart-class destroyers. They're going to enable our maritime assets to strike land targets at greater distance with better precision. The long-range anti-ship missiles for our F-18 Super Hornets can strike 
land and maritime targets. The JSAMs for our FA-18, 18F Super Hornets and in our future F-35s as well. We're enhancing our capabilities in offensive cyber, in hypersonic systems, in autonomous systems, in space capabilities. And we are confident, as I said at the beginning of your question, that these will address the potential Minister, security challenges the in the coming decades as we move to the new submarine acquisition. Expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. So, great attention, fewer submarines. Last week, uh, Admiral Noonan conceded that by 2040, uh, further extending the life of the Collins boats will leave them, and I quote, at far greater risk of detection. Will the government purchase off-the-shelf submarines to be built in Adelaide to serve as the Navy's Super Hornet interim solution uh, to the F-35? Minister. That's a fascinating metaphor, an underwater Super Hornet F-35. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Patrick, uh, for, your, uh, for your question. And I think I understand the point that, uh, that you are raising, but uh, with your experience, I would think you would appreciate how inefficient it might be for the Royal Australian Navy to try to operate three different classes of submarines simultaneously that require different basing, different crewing, different sustainment. Uh, so the Collins class submarine life of type extension remains an essential element of the government's plan to maintain a potent and agile submarine capability for Australia. It has a core work package that includes updates and upgrades to diesel engines, to the main motor to, and power conversion equipment. Both defence and industry are continuing to progress Collins class submarine life of type extension work on schedule to support so the first broken. boat that will need an extension, that's HMAS Farncom, as you know, commencing in mid-2026. Uh, and ASC will lead the life of type extension design and implementation activities. Minister, Minister the time for the answer has so expired. Senator. Senator Patrick, you have a second supplementary? I do. Um, um, we have a submarine, Minister, we have a submarine construction workforce in, in disarray after the cancellation of the attack submarine program. The, the nuclear submarine uh, built in Adelaide for delivery in 2040, by simple calculation, will commence construction in the mid-2030s. We don't have a workforce valley of death, rather we have a Grand Canyon. What will the government be doing to fill this Grand Canyon? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I absolutely disagree with the proposition that, uh, that Senator Patrick puts um, in relation to that. We are absolutely committed to ensuring that critical skills are retained in the shipbuilding sector uh, in Australia. Order in fact, our commitment to continuous left. naval shipbuilding will support at least 15,000 Australian jobs by the end of the decade, and over 5,000 of those will be in South Australia. We know that the Osborne Naval Shipyard in South Australia is one of two principal shipyards. We know Osborne is hosting the construction of nine hunter-class frigates, plus major upgrades to the uh, Navy's three AWDs and full-cycle docking of six Collins-class submarines. The Morrison government, frankly, has delivered on our commitment to provide, as I said, our service women and men with the vital equipment they need to keep us safe in the budget. And what we are doing is being committed to finding a role for every skilled shipbuilding worker impacted by the attack class decision. We'll pa partner with ASC to manage and implement the new sovereign shipbuilding talent pool as well, which will Minister, redeploy the existing shipbuilding the workforce throughout current and new shipbuilding has programs. Expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Order. Minister update the Senate on how Australia's national security remains under the real threat of foreign interference and espionage? Minister, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Oh, sorry, I missed the Attorney General. Sorry, Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Betts for the question. And I acknowledge his uh, long, long, long interest in national security uh, matters in Australia. And, Mr. President, whilst the government has been focused on tackling the threat of COVID-19, we have never, ever lost sight of the many challenges to our safety and security that exist in what we know is a rapidly changing security environment. As Australians would be aware, the threat environment it constantly evolves. And in fact, it may come as a surprise to most Australians to know that the levels of espionage and foreign interference are higher now than during the Cold War. We know that there are foreign agents working with intent 
to damage our society. They want to undermine our security and they want to interfere with the work of governments and ultimately with the work of our country. In their recent annual report, ASIO Director General Mike Burgess said that espionage could well rival terrorism as a threat to our interests and to our safety. And of course, as members of parliament, it is incredibly important for us to remind ourselves that we can also be targets for foreign interference and espionage, and especially those who aspire to be ministers in any government. As the Director General Mike Burgess said, foreign spies are attempting to obtain classified information about Australia's trade relationships, defence and intelligence capabilities. They are seeking to develop targeted relationships with current and former politicians and current and former security clearance holders. We should always be careful, Mr President, of underplaying the danger of being cavalier about the intentions of these types of people, of these characters and actors, should our paths cross with them as we go about our duties. As members of parliament, we must always remain ever vigilant to the threats posed by espionage and foreign interference. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the attorney for her answer, albeit a very concerning answer. Can I ask how is the government responding to the changing nature of foreign interference and how do nefarious actors now work against our nation's interests? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr President. Well, we know from our intelligence and our security agencies that foreign interference it is changing and unfortunately it is expanding, especially with the ubiquity of digital technology now right across the globe. We know in particular that some communities are targeted by foreign actors in an attempt to recruit and even unknowingly push foreign nations' interests in and around Australia. And that is why, as a government, we have strengthened Australia's capacity to defend against foreign interference with legislative tools. These key pieces of legislation they are helping our intelligence and our law enforcement agencies continue to have the legislative framework and the tools that they need to appropriately deal with and disrupt these actors. We will continue to make any changes necessary to ensure that, as a nation, we can respond to changing threats from foreign actors and protect Australia's interests. Senator Betts, second supplementary question. Can the minister also update the Senate on how the government continues to support our vital intelligence and security agencies to target and disrupt foreign interference and protect our country's interests? Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, our government has invested over $145 million since 2018-19 to bolster our response to foreign interference in Australia. Mr President, in the 2021-22 budget, we allocated the largest long-term investment in ASIO to address the complex and dynamic national security environment with $1.3 billion over the next decade. We've also passed legislation that will ensure that the Foreign Minister, on the advice of our security agencies, can veto agreements with foreign countries struck by state and local governments, as well as with universe, as universities. This legislation will ensure that any deal with a foreign country is in accordance with Australia's national interest. Mr President, as I've said, we know that foreign actors are now using cyber tactics to further interfere with Australia's interests, and that's why we've made a huge investment with the Australian Signals Directorate. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Mr Morrison's original transition plan, which was based on an outbreak of only 30 cases, estimates that 12,000 people will end up in hospital, including more than 2,700 in ICU, with over 1,400 dying. We have since seen more than 1,000 cases a day across the country. How many hospitalisations, ICU admissions and deaths does the Morrison-Joyce government now expect as states begin to open up? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Question, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Grogan, for a question. First question. Uh, Mr. President, the national plan uh, is designed to provide protection and provide advice to governments, state, territory and Commonwealth, uh, as to the parameters 
we can, uh, with which we can start to reopen the national economy, Mr. President. And so once we reached 70% uh, of the uh, population fully vaccinated, which we have now, we can start to take some measures, and you've seen those things commencing uh, in the states and territories, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the whole purpose of the national plan is to minimise the number of infections of the virus, Mr. President, and also uh, subsequent to that hospitalisations and presentations at ICUs and, of course, to minimise the number of people who pass away. So the whole objective is to minimise those numbers, Mr President. Uh, that's the point of the plan and that's why we continue to encourage Australians to access vaccines. Uh, we've reached 70 per cent of the population Order. over 16 who are vaccinated. We encourage more Australians in every walk of life, in every state and territory, to go out and access the vaccine so that we can continue to do that, Mr President, because the whole purpose of the exercise is to minimise the number of cases that we have in the community, uh, and that, of course, minimises the number of, uh, of Australians who may be hospitalised, Mr President, or minimises the number of people who may uh, be subject to uh, ICU or, Mr President, uh, those, who unfortunately, who might pass away. Uh, Mr. President, we know that there will be COVID circulating in the community. The best way, Mr. President, that Australians can protect themselves, protect their families, and protect the communities, Mr. President, is to get vaccinated. And the more people who are vaccinated, Mr. President, the less people who will be subject to the virus, its spread, and of course, hospitalisation and ICU. Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Mr. Colbeck, so Senator Colbeck, the Australian Medical Association has warned that the shortage of hospital beds, overcrowded emergency departments and longer wait waits were, and I quote, risking the lives of all Australians. Why has the Morrison-Joyce government refused to act on the urgent calls for funding from all state and territory health ministers before it's too late? Minister. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. And, uh, thank Thanks, Senator Grogan, for the question. Mr. President, on my left. Mr. President, the, the, the Australian Minister, government Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Order. Order. The Minister had not even commenced his answer when the interjection started. Interjections are always disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Order. Senator Ayres. I literally just ruled. Senator Colbeck, Minister, you have the call. Thank you. It's a bit of a record, Mr. President. I actually got to seven seconds once before I was stopped, so to get it before I start is not doing too bad. Mr. President, all states and territories, as a part of their conversations with the Senator Australian Watt. government, have indicated that they have adequate capacity to meet demand based on the Doherty modelling supplemented by their own modelling, Mr. President. Mr. President, and during COVID, during COVID, the Australian government has invested, along with the states and territories, into the health system just for COVID in excess of $6.6 billion, Mr. President. $6.6 billion, and that funding has been put put in, particularly in res with respect to the, health, the, uh, the state health systems, on a 50-50 basis, Order. Mr. President. Uh, so $6.6 billion invested by the Australian government in support of the states and territories in fighting Minister, COVID. Minister, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary question. Thank you. AMA President Dr Omar Khorshid has said, and I quote, once COVID comes in, the only way we can look after people with COVID is to stop looking after all the other people that we are currently looking after. Will the minister guarantee Australians will be safe? Minister. They're all there. Thank you, Mr President. Well, the Australian government moved very early to put in place a number of measures to support the health system uh, in the event of significant outbreaks of COVID. Uh, and there have been a, a continuation of measures, obviously, that's been, that have been undertaken since then. One of the first things, Mr President, that we did to support the public health system was the private hospitals agreement, Mr President, which allowed those private hospitals to support the public health system in the case of a huge surge in numbers. Of course, Mr President, as we vaccinate more Australians, as more Australians take up the opportunity to vaccinate, uh, to, to have a vaccination. That again 
reduces the, the possibilities of COVID transmitting through the community. It protects individuals from serious illness, uh, hospitalisation and death. That's the point of the vaccination process. Uh, and that is also factored into the Doherty modelling that uh, is dictating our opening up process, Mr President. So all of this carefully calculated Minister, and agreed with the Minister, states. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals plan to position Australia as a leading supplier of critical minerals and rare earth elements, and how this will create jobs and boost investment in the mining industries while meeting the growing global demand for new energy technologies required in a modern economy. The Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and, and I thank Senator Davey for her question because Senator Davey understands that the coalition government is a government that backs our minerals and our resources sector. Critical minerals and rare earth elements are a really, really exciting new chapter for our resource sector, and Australia is extraordinarily blessed. We have some of the largest deposits of, uh, of rare uh, minerals and critical minerals in the world. We've got the second largest reserve of lithium, the sixth largest rare earths reserve, and substantial reserves of cobalt, magnesium, tungsten, and zirconium. So, critical minerals have a broad range of applications, as we know, um, you know, ranging from things as simple as batteries and mobile phones, but going Order. up to things like wind turbines and even fighter jets. The application is extraordinary. And that's why, as a coalition government, we are backing this sector, because we understand that the opportunity for Australia is absolutely huge. We've put to a, to, together a $2 billion loan facility, the Critical Minerals Facility, which will ensure that Australia remains at the absolute forefront of the emerging opportunities in the global resources sector. And our loan facility will help unearth critical minerals and get developments off the ground. In doing so, these projects will help secure vital supplies of resources needed to drive a technology-led energy recovery. These materials will be used in advanced technologies such as renewable energy, aerospace, defence, um, electric vehicles, communications, telecommunications and agri-tech, which I'm sure Senator Davey is uh, particularly excited about. The lithium industry alone um, is forecast to be worth $400 billion globally by 2030. Uh, but in addition to our global resources strategy, we will also identify new markets for critical minerals and facilitate opportunities for expanding trade. We must ensure that Australia harnesses these new markets in the interests of all Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And I am very passionate about Australia's growing critical minerals mining. And can the Minister outline who will benefit from the government's investment in critical minerals. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, everybody benefits from this uh, activity. Studies indicate that, as I said, global demand for critical minerals needed for clean technology applications are going to grow exponentially over the coming decades. Australia is well placed to become a really reliable supplier of these critical minerals. Who will benefit? It's very, very simple, Senator Davey. Our investment will mean three key things. More jobs, more expert options and a stronger economy for Australia. Jobs for the next generation of engineers, tradies, apprentices who will build and operate these mines. Jobs in construction and infrastructure development to help get the product to market. Jobs in defence, aerospace, high-end manufacturing and other sectors that will use our critical minerals. Jobs to support new and emerging technologies and, overall, more support for our regional communities who supply these critical minerals to the rest of the world. In short, Senator Davey, everyone will benefit in Australia. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you. And, and more specifically for, for my interests, how will the export and potential value add of rare minerals benefit local towns and regional centres like Parks and Cobar and the wet southern western districts of New South Wales where critical minerals are mined? Minister. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, there are a number of areas in Australia that are already seeing benefits from critical minerals, such as the parks precinct in your home state of New South Wales, um, Senator Davey. The New South Wales government estimates that through continued investment in critical minerals, more than 2,300 construction and ongoing jobs could be created for central New South Wales. The nine most advanced critical mineral projects in Australia could support 7,000 jobs and will unlock nearly $8 billion in investment for regional and rural communities alone. Australia's current battery industry is estimated to already contribute $1.3 billion to our GDP and 6,000 jobs, mostly in regional Australia. The Order. Future Batteries Industry CRC at estimated diverse, diversified battery industries could add 34,700 new jobs uh, in Australia and $7.4 billion to Australia's economy, Minister, much of which Minister, will be the benefit Minister, of rural and regional Australia. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. The President of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, has warned that if Australia does not adopt a net zero by 2050 emissions target, it would, quote, punish farmers and that, quote, we can't afford to squander this opportunity. Is Ms Simpson wrong? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much. And it's fantastic to have Senator Watt ask a question about agriculture. He's been here a while, talks a big game from Brisbane on behalf of uh, rural and regional Queensland, but it's fantastic. And I, I hope he's also met with the NFF. Um, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm from the south. Uh, Brisbane, Gold Coast, it's all the same to me. He talks a big game. I'm hoping you have met with AgForce, who is the Queensland representative on the NFF, because they actually have very strong views of this particular issue. They are very, very clear. Whilst obviously agriculture is making great uh, inroads into lowering emissions and different production uh, systems, whether it's the grains industry and carbon sequestration, whether it is the beef industry uh, committing to net zero by 2030. Uh, without a carbon tax, Minister, I might say, which your Minister, government. Please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr. President, uh, I know Senator McKenzie isn't close enough to the farming community to know that there's a difference Senator between Watt, the NFF Senator and Ag Force. Watt, points of order. Our question Senator is about... Watt, sit down. Points of order are not an opportunity to make gratuitous comments across the chamber. You have the call, but please make a point of order. On relevance, the question was about the National Farmers Federation rather than any other farming group that the minister chooses to talk about. S Senator Watt, Senator Watt. Senator Canavan, on the point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr, Mr. President. Um, uh, on the point of order, uh, if uh, Senator Watt actually knew something about the agricultural industry, Senator, he would know, he would know that Ag Force the... is a member of NFF. That Ag Force Senator is a Canavan. member of NFF. So it's Senator exactly Canavan. relevant. It's Senator exactly Canavan, relevant. He knows nothing resume about your farmers. Seat. Senator Wong. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Senator Wong on the point of order. On a... Silence. Order in the chamber. Order. Order. Senator Wong on the point of order. Uh, well, Mr. President, I'd ask you to reflect after question time. Um, you did deal very sternly with Senator Watt very quickly. Senator Canavan continued to ignore your I rule, but I, I, I haven't finished sorry. my submission, Mr. President. Order on my right. We just want even handedness, sir. <laughs> Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I was calling Senator Canavan to order. S Senator Gallagher, Senator Watt, had you completed your point of order? I'm listening. Ve order on my right. 
I was listening very carefully to the answer. You've had the chance to direct the Minister back to the question. Uh, I do not believe I need to do more than that at this point. I am listening carefully to the answer. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, um speak to Fiona Simpson, the president of the NFF, regularly. I also speak to Georgie Somerset, the president of your own Farmers' Federation, a member of the, Nationals Farmers, uh, the National Farmers' Federation, Georgie Somerset, uh, president of AgForce. And you know what? They've made very, very clear to me, to the coalition and to the National Party party room in the context of this debate, is that farmers have done their fair share, that they have done the heavy lifting and that they want that recognised. And you know why they did the heavy lifting? Because of the Queensland government's native vegetation laws. It is because of the Palaszczuk state Labor government's— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order, direct relevance. Order. Order. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order, direct relevance. The, the question went to a statement by the president of the NFF uh, as to if Australia doesn't adopt a net net zero by 2050, it will punish farmers and whether or not Ms Simpson was wrong. We, I, I didn't intervene, I didn't uh, raise a point of order earlier uh, about the, the lengthy discussion about ag force, etc. This is now an entirely different subject. Senator McKenzie. I've been the sh Order on my right. Order on my right. Senator you forget Wong. that I was Shadow Minister for Trade. A lot no, of people no, I had to talk to. <laughs> you remember that. This is not an opportunity <laughs> well, for discussion know, across the table. I'm very happy to answer questions. I might actually stick Senator to the Wong. question. Senator Wong, Direct please relevance. complete your Thank point you. of order. Yes, well, I think I have. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> Senator Canavan, on the point of order. order. I, 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 in, the minister was clearly uh, referring to the arguments that the National Farmers Federation have made this week around their position, which did, does relate uh, to tree clearing and native vegetation laws around this country. I, uh, Senator Wong, I, uh, I'm prepared to make a ruling. Uh, I, I believe that while Senator McKenzie has not been uh, in breach of standing orders, I, I am listening carefully to the answer. I, I do think there is a risk of straying, but I do not believe that Senator McKenzie has strayed from the question. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. I think I did uh, touch all the high notes. The National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, net zero. What farmers are absolutely sick and tired of is a Labor Party that doesn't understand the contribution that they make and understand that they actually want to be compensated and recognised for the contribution they've already made to the reduction Minister, in emissions Minister, in this country. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Minerals Council of Australia, which represents resources companies including BHP, Rio Tinto and Whitehaven Coal, has endorsed net zero by 2050, saying the mineral sector has confidence a net zero emissions by 2050 target can be reached. Is the Minerals Council of Australia wrong? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very, very much. And I do note um, in putting their support forward for an aspirational target of net zero by 2050, the Minerals Council a couple of weeks ago made it very, very clear that we can't do that without our carbon, uh, carbon capture and storage technology being implemented in this country. So we look forward to the Labor Party supporting National Party amendments to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which will do exactly that, which will actually ensure that the dirty deal done by Gillard and Brown to establish the Clean Senator Energy McKenzie. Corporation will Senator actually McKenzie. fund carbon Minister. capture and storage. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, there certainly are dirty deals at the moment, and Senator McKenzie could talk about them. But Senator my Wong, point of order again. My point of order. Senator Rennick. Uh, I'm happy to give leave for Senator Rennick to speak. Senator Wong. Please. 
This is not. I move. You, this, you want to do that? This, we, we will give you. If you stand up and seek Senator leave, Wong. we will give you Senator leave. Senator Wong, resume your seat. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I will. Senator Wong. Points of order are not an opportunity to debate matters across the chamber, and nor for interjections from my right. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Rennick. Senator Watt. I will give Senator Wong the opportunity to restate her point of order. Senator Wong. Have you finished, Senator Wong? All right. I am listening carefully to the answer. You've had the chance to bring the minister back to the question. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I was saying, carbon capture and storage technologies, along, I must have, along with uh, nuclear technologies, are recognised by the International Energy Agency as the two technologies which are actually going to be essential to getting to a low emissions future. So I actually look forward to the Labor Party and the Greens supporting 21st century technologies Minister, that will... Minister, yeah. resume your seat. Now, Okay. If the chamber agrees, we can do the supplementary equip, a question, the final supplementary question. There is no objection. Senator Watt, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the comments of the National Farmers Federation and the Minerals Council of Australia, when will the fake farmers and the fake miners in the National Party listen to the real farmers and the real miners who support net zero by 2050? Uh, Minister. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I, I am a little concerned, Mr. President, that the amount of um, the amount of point of orders that have been taken during this answer have meant that I actually don't get asked my dixer by uh, Senator Matt Canavan on the fabulous work we're doing uh, in Queensland for the beef industry uh, and Blair and Josie Angus up at. But um, I love the fact that Senator Watt thinks it's too cute by half talking about fake and real farmers. I would put Senator Watt. I would put a hundred bucks Senator on Watt. the president's table that you have never Senator sat down Watt. with a real farmer Senator in your Watt. life. I am going to ask Georgie Somerset, the president of AgForce, to come and pay you a little visit so she can actually talk you through what your outrageous state Labor government has done to Queensland farmers and that we are meeting and beating our um, emission targets as a result of their hard work. As a result of their hard work. We will always Minister, stand up for farmers. Minister, your time has expired. We have now hit a hard marker. Um, sorry, I just need to just quickly consult with the I understand that uh, Senator Smith is seeking leave of the chamber to do committee memberships. Um, is leave granted? The president has received a letter nominating senators to be members of committees. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? <laughs> I'll try that again. Is leave granted? Senator Very much. Smith. Mr. President, I move that uh, Senator Scar be appointed to the Economics, Legislation and References Committee, Senator McGrath be appointed to the Procedure Committee, and Senator Van be appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Hume. Mr President, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the order for production of documents discussed during a public hearing of the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on the 19th of July 2021, agreed to in this place yesterday. I note that the doc documents sought under this order were also sought under the order for production of documents number 1217. I also note that the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, through me, responded to that order on 2 September 2021. With regard to the clauses, uh, to clauses 1A and D of this order, and further to the Minister's correspondence to this place on 2 September 2021, 
I am advised that the documents subject to this order, reliant on the description during a public hearing of the Re Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on 19 July 2021, cannot be tabled as no document matching this description has been seen by either the minister, his office or his department. With regards to spreadsheets sought under clauses 1b and c of this order, and further to the minister's correspondence to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee of 4 August 2021, and to this place of 2 September 2021, I remind the Senate that the documents subject to these clauses of the order are subject to a public interest immunity claim on the grounds that the release of those documents would disclose the deliberations of Cabinet. And I table that document uh, relating to the order of production of documents concerning the Urban Congestion Fund. Thank you. Senator Keneally? Thank you, Mr President. I rise to take note of the Minister's answer. Go Thank ahead. you. Well, Mr President, you can set your watch to it. The Senate orders the Morrison-Joyce government to produce documents relating to a dodgy grant, and the Morrison-Joyce government just flat out refuses to deliver. They are shameless, are they not? They're addicted to secrecy, allergic to accountability. There is no standard so low that they can't limbo underneath it. They think they are above the law. Of course, Senator Patrick points out there are blind trusts. Perhaps, as we see in the House yesterday, there is a new low standard. That, well, here we go. We know that the Morrison-Joyce government members, they break the rules that they don't care about and they change the rules that they can. The Senate ordered that the minister lay on the table emails, spreadsheets, maps related to the car park Rort scandal. We know from the ANAO that the projects under the Car Parts Rort pro program were picked from a list titled the Top 20 Marginal Electorates. You can't get more blatant than that. We know that hundreds of millions of dollars were shoveled out the door on projects announced during the 2019 federal election campaign. And we know that 77% of the car park sites ended up in coalition electorates and not in areas where they were most needed. The ANAO found out that, surprise, surprise, senators, that none of the 47 project sites selected for funding commitments were proposed by the Department of Infrastructure. None of them. None of them. This is egregious. This is wholesale rorting. Wholesale rorting. The government that Mr. Morrison leads is littered with examples of scandal, rorting and waste. I have lost track, Madam Deputy President, of the number of ministers who have been exposed for their misconduct and their dodgy dealings. Taylor, McKenzie, Colbeck, Cash, Lay, Dutton, Fletcher, Robert, Tudge, Hunt, Rustin, Reynolds and Porter. All of these ministers have been linked to one scandal or another. I wish Car Park Rorts was an anomaly. But this is a new, new normal for the Morrison-Joyce government. They spend taxpayer money like it is Liberal National Party money. The sheer quantum of misconduct by those opposite is simply staggering. I don't think it's about to get any better, by the way. There's a federal election right around the corner, and this tired eight-year-old Liberal National government doesn't have any other tricks up its sleeve. There's never been a better time, in fact, to be a color-coded spreadsheet than under Mr. Morrison and his mates. Ann Webster. Ann Webster, the member for Mali, had an uncharacteristic moment of honesty from the Morrison-Joyce government, but she's new. She might grow out of that. Anyway, she had an uncharacteristic moment of honesty when she belled the cat on the Building Better Regions rorts. She revealed that coalition MPs can basically just ask for any money they want, regardless of the rules of the grant. On, depending on the whims of the minister in any given day, they might just get that money. They might just get that money. Well, I've been in politics long enough to know that there is a view out there in the community that grift and graft and dodgy deals are just par for the course, the nature of the beast, the cost of doing business. I think the former Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, in fact, said, what's wrong with pork barreling? Everybody does it. She might have a different view about that these days, by the way. The voters supposedly factored in, this view is supposedly factored in by voters because, quote, all political parties do it and all right. politicians are in it for themselves. But what is clear? 
from car park warts, sports warts, building better regions warts, all 22 of the slush funds in Mr. Morrison's recent budget, is that we are experiencing an all-time low for government accountability in this country. This is uniquely bad. We've had grants for rural and regional communities handed to projects that are literally next door to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We've had sports clubs and marginal seats given money for female change room facilities when they have no women's teams. We've had funding for community safety grants cut so the minister could spend cash in an election <coughs> announcement. The behavior of the Morrison-Joyce government is brazen. Mr. Morrison appears to have a blatant disregard for the rules and institutions of our democracy. The Australian people have a right to know what their government gets up to. They have a right to know how their money is being spent. They have a right to expect a higher standard from their elected officials. But Mr. Morrison and his mates, they don't even try to hide it anymore. Asked about the car park rorts earlier this year, the minister representing the prime minister in this place, Senator Birmingham, simply shrugged and he said, look, the Australian people had their chance and they voted the government back in at the last election. They're not even trying to hide this anymore. Why attempt, by the way, to defend the indefensible? You kind of got to admire the hide of the whole thing. They're just hoping that no one pays close enough attention to their bad behavior. As long as they get reelected, what do they care? Well, it's a disgraceful attitude. It is beyond contempt, particularly when we see communities that need community safety funding not getting it, particularly when we see areas that are affected by congestion neglected for a car park because they just happen to be in a labor-held seat. Frankly, though, people are catching on. Look at what we saw yesterday in the House of Representatives. For the first time since Federation, a government has voted against the Speaker. Get voted against a motion the Speaker has given precedence to, namely that former Minister Christian Porter should be investigated for his failure to declare a million-dollar blind trust. We're all public servants in this place. We all have to follow the rules. We all have to be accountable to our constituents and the broader public. Christian Porter's decision to accept this money constitutes, without declaring it, constitutes at least an investigation. It looks like an outrageous breach of office, and he should be investigated. And that was the view of the Speaker, a Liberal Party colleague of Mr. Porter's, who ruled there was a prima facie case for referral. And Labor supported the referral. It was Mr. Morrison, the Prime Minister. It was Mr. Joyce, the Deputy Prime Minister, and all of their mates in the government who didn't. They held their nose and they voted against the Speaker for the first time in nearly 120 years in a blatant display of disregard for transparency and accountability. It's extraordinary. It is quite literally without precedent in this country. The member for Pierce is being protected by the Prime Minister. It's the only explanation here. He's the only Western Australian this Prime Minister has ever stood up for, and that speaks volumes for this Prime Minister. The Morrison government will hound people to their death with robo-debt, but they'll help a disgraced former minister cover up his million-dollar blind trust. No wonder they don't want to fund a federal ICAC. No wonder they don't want to even present the legislation for a national anti-corruption commission. No wonder they don't want to answer questions on notice. No wonder they don't want to abide by orders from the Senate to produce documents. This prime minister doesn't like answering questions because he knows the Australian people won't like the answers. If the documents requested by the Senate today could make the government look good, then we'd have seen them by now. So what are they hiding? What are they hiding? When voter cynicism in government grows, politicians like Mr. Morrison flourish. Blokes like Mr. Morrison have made a career out of exceeding, over-shrinking, ever-shrinking expectations. The only way we can restore the Australian people's faith in our democracy is by showing this lot the door. Because unless we get a government that is serious about a national anti-corruption commission, 
this type of warting and scandals and blind trust and disregarding the speaker and not answering questions on notice and not producing documents is simply going to continue. After eight long years of this tired liberal national government, the Australian people deserve a government that is on their side. So let me be clear, in this chamber and with the Australian people, an Albanese Labor government will deliver a national anti-corruption commission, one with teeth, one that will bring transparency and accountability so long lacking in this tired eight-year-old Liberal National Government, we will bring that to the national level. Because the Australian people deserve to know what's being done with their money, they deserve to have accountability and transparency in their government, and they deserve a government that is on their side. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I was so disappointed with this minister's response to my order for production of documents. Incredibly disappointed, but not surprised. This government has got form. They have got so much form with hiding information, hiding the fact that they make decisions based on their political interests, what suits their interests, making decisions based on the interests of them, their mates, big business, Making, making decisions based on what they think is going to take to win them seats rather than what is in the interests of ordinary Australians. This is the second time that the minister has failed to present the documents that were set out in this order. And I was particularly disappointed that even we didn't even, they didn't even attempt to give any extra reason as to why they shouldn't give, give these, these documents. They sent, basically simply resent a letter stating that in relation to some of the requests that neither Minister Fletcher nor his office nor the department have seen the documents. May I remind people that this is despite the fact that these documents were referred to by the Australian National Audit Office at a hearing of the Rural and, Regional Rural and Regional Transport Committee. The ANAO aren't making it up. The ANAO are there as the audit office to inquire into actions and programs of department. They don't make stuff up. The Auditor General, the, the, the auditor told us that there was this document that referred to the top 20 marginal seats. And yet, Minister Fletcher and Minister Hume, through him, are saying that neither, that no one happens to have seen these documents. So I really want to ask, how closely have they looked? I mean, their letter says the documents aren't to hand. I mean, how convenient. Maybe they just accidentally fell into a shredder or something. And of course, what makes this so upsetting is that this isn't the first time. This government has got form. Let's take us back to sports rorts. In January 2020, when he was asked about sports rorts at the press club, the Prime Minister said, all we did was to provide information based on the representations made to us, as every Prime Minister has done. And in March 2020, the Prime Minister said, we provided information based on the representations made to us, and that included information about other funding options or programs relevant to the project proposals. It wasn't until two months later, in May 2020, after significant new information had come to light, that the Prime Minister admitted that they'd been involved in providing approvals for those sports rorts programs. The only authority sought from the Prime Minister's office and from me was in relation to announcements, I said. But subsequently, what we learnt through the committee process was that McKenzie, Minister McKenzie's office had sent dozens of spreadsheets to the Prime Minister's office, had sought approvals for particular rounds of funding, and the sports rorts funding was expanded after a meeting between Minister McKenzie and the Prime Minister following spreadsheets that were sent to the Prime Minister's office. So let's be very clear. When it comes to hiding information, being slippery with language and conveniently forgetting things until they're forced to acknowledge them, this government has got form.
And when it comes to the information that's in these documents, this is not the end of the matter. There is a long way to go. We've got Senate estimates next week. We've got a committee into these car park rorts. And I'm confident that more information is going to come to light. I mean, the refusal by this government to be transparent with the truth doesn't change our commitment to actually getting to the truth and to hold them accountable, to hold this government accountable. We will use the Senate. We will use the information that we've got from the AANAO. I mean, this rorting of this grant scheme, it matters on multiple levels. As I've been saying, it's just consistent with the government using government processes, using government funding, using grant processes to be serving their own political interests rather than the interests of the community. But it also matters when it comes to just good governance, making good decisions. I mean, I want to talk about the transport policy before going on in a bit more detail about the corruption. I mean, this, was the, this whole grant fund was the Urban Congestion Fund. The whole point of this grant fund is supposedly to be busting congestion. Let me share one of the submissions that we've received into the car parks inquiry that we've just set up on this issue from the University of Melbourne transport um, experts. And they say that after years of research on how do you solve urban congestion, the overwhelming conclusion of these investigations is that congestion reduction has failed because of the bias to solutions based on expanding road capacity. Put simply, the experience all over the world since the 1970s confirms that additional capacity induces new demand. This ensures congestion returns to or exceeds initial levels very soon after additional capacity is added. In the case of bottlenecks, which is a specific focus of the Urban Congestion Fund, when one bottleneck is removed, the choke point simply moves to the next. It is now widely accepted by transport planners that building additional road capacity is not a cost-effective means to reduce congestion. More success has been achieved through measures that address demand, such as pricing reform and strategic land use planning. Sadly, we haven't seen that road pricing reform, despite years of waiting for it. Which, and so it then goes to what is so tragically wrong with this rort, that building new car parks, just like building new roads, will not solve congestion. And when we ask in Senate estimates, you know, what's the justification for even spending money on car parks in order to, to solve con congestion? The officials, of course, had no clear answer how they identified these car park projects or how they linked into broader infrastructure planning, including the work done by Infrastructure Australia. But of course, we know why that was because the officials were trying to have to pretend that there was some rhyme and reason and semblance of connection with um, transport policy behind them. But it was because the whole entire program is a rort. They didn't pick the car parks on any kind of sensible plan. Basically, they sent around yet another spreadsheet with a list of electorates each project was in. So it wasn't, it wasn't at all a surprise to learn that the same staffer who was involved in sports rorts had been involved, was involved with the car park rorts. And, so, and we also know that we saw government moving projects between programs, so shifting them from the Community Support Infrastructure Fund to the Community Development Grants Fund and, and the Urban Congestion Fund. So it seems increasingly clear that this isn't a case of just a single rort multiplied multiple times. It is basically the Prime Minister's office serving as a coordination point between the Liberal Party election campaign and different programs that are being run across different portfolios. This is one mega rort being run out of the Prime Minister's office. And that's why the wish lists that we use for sports rorts mattered. They weren't just wish lists for changing rooms, they were wish lists for election commitment projects across multiple types of projects. And as Michael West Media has noted, often these projects, particularly the car parks, follow a pattern. First the MP organises a petition to harvest contact details, and then, hey presto, suddenly they've got a grant to announce right before the election. Look, it's, I mean, it's almost as if there was a systematic, coordinated process to use public announcements to bolster their election can chances without doing the hard work of genuine consultation and policy development. And, I mean, the scale of the Liberal Party's approach to these funds is so awful that there are layers of misspending. Um, 
I mean, we saw that, you know, of course, in New South Wales with the recent ICAC inquiry in New South Wales. I mean, one of Mike Baird's staffers questioned the advocacy by the then Treasurer of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, and questioned why they were spending money in a safe seat. Clearly, they saw the value in spending public funding in marginal seats for their electoral benefit. But on top of that layer of corruption, the former Treasurer wanted a pet project. And entirely coincidentally, it appears that she was in the electorate of someone she was in a relationship with. The sad truth is, with this government, it's genuinely hard keeping track of all the different programs they've tried to rort. Sports rorts, car park rorts, the Community Development Grants Fund, and the list goes on. It's exactly why we need a federal ICAC with teeth. It's exactly why we need to have something that goes to the heart of the corruption of this government, highlighting the, election, the inaction of this government, the refusal to pass an ICAC, despite the fact that the Greens bill for a federal ICAC passed the Senate two years ago and, has, or, and is there on the books, ready to be implemented if we only had an honest Thank rather you, than a Senator corrupt Rice, government. Thank you, Senator Rice. Your time has expired. If there are no more speakers, I intend to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, I move that A, the hours of meeting be 9.30am till adjournment. B, the following bills be called on following motions to take note of answers and have precedence over all other business till determined. Customs Amendment, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill and Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response, Better Advice, Bill 2021, and C, divisions may take place after 4.30pm, and D, uh, the Senate adjourn without debate at the conclusion of the general business debate, which will be considered for not more than 60 minutes. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wong. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the failure of the government to comply with order for the production of documents number 1251. Is leave granted? Uh, yes. Thank you. Minister. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks Chair. Uh, the government will not deny leave. Uh, um, we sought to deny leave uh, earlier today in relation to uh, this motion. Uh, I recognise the vote of the Senate uh, at that time, which agreed to suspend standing orders uh, at that stage. And we won't prolong debate in the Senate. The government still believes that uh, consideration of this is just a stunt by the opposition, completely unnecessary on their behalf, uh, and in doing so um, is, uh, is simply uh, seeking to further politicise uh, debates uh, in relation to climate change and emissions reduction uh, and is seeking to get ahead uh, of, uh, of matters that are rightly being considered by the government to take a fully informed position uh, to the Glasgow Climate Change Conference. However, recognising that the will of the Senate has already been expressed, uh, we won't uh, object to, by way of leave denial at this time. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move the motion which has been circulated in the chamber, which I am happy to read if the chamber so wishes. But it relates to so, uh, relates to the failure of the government to respond to the order of production of documents one two five one moved by Senator Patrick Tring in Canavan, and requires the minister representing the minister for industry, energy, and emissions reduction to the, attend the Senate immediately to provide an explanation. Uh, the terms of the motion have been circulated in the chamber. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Davey. I draw attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, yes, quorum required, I believe. Ring the bells.
Our quorum's been reached. Thank you. So um, I'll call you, Senator Seselja. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, so uh, I table a response uh, to the order of production of documents, um, if I could, and I'll just have a copy <laughs> with me as well. Uh, Please continue. Yeah, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, so, uh, the uh, I, I might just read the uh, I might just read the table document. So, um, as Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, I write with regard to the Senate Order for Production of Documents Number One Two Five One, moved by Senator Patrick, and agreed by the Senate on 20 October <coughs> 2021 on the matter of modelling relating to the government's emission reduction strategy. Noting sensitivities incumbent on a request for Cabinet documents and the time frame provided to respond, I advise that more time will be required to comply with the order. A more detailed response will be provided to the Senate by Friday 29 October, consistent with Standing Order 166, and I enclose a letter from the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction confirming this advice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Thank you. Pursuant to the motion, I rise to take note of, of that response and make a few points. One, just to be very clear, that the government spent some time today filibustering and uh, running procedural games to avoid having a vote on the motion that they've just now had to have a vote on. And the reason the government conceded that vote is it knew that a number of its senators were, to their credit, prepared to cross the floor to support a motion requiring the minister to attend. Recall that the order for production of documents that is uh, uh, the subject of this motion that was not complied with by Minister Cezelia, was not complied with by the government, was a motion in fact supported by Senator Matt Canavan. So a government, minister, a government senator moving a motion against uh, his own government or requiring his own government to provide uh, the economic modelling that they have been uh, talking about. Uh, so that, that is all of the shenanigans today were to avoid a vote that the government has just conceded. So it's just to be very clear what has occurred. Senator Canavan made clear he was prepared to cross the floor, as I have to say was the private indication from another of other Liberal senators. Uh, this is a government utterly divided. But I do want to take, make, uh, make some comments. Senator McKenzie, how are you? Uh, yes, I do want to make uh, some brief comments, if I may, about uh, the approach of the government to, uh, to secrecy and the approach to the government to transparency and the approach to the government uh, to accountability. The, the government want to keep this modelling secret because they know that, that they have cost Australia billions of dollars by standing in the way of action on climate and renewables. And it's not the only secret, of course, that we know the Morrison-Joyce government is determined to keep from Australians. Recall that yesterday Mr Morrison got every one of his MPs to vote to protect Christian Porter and his secret donations. But he can't get, he can't get his divided government to vote for net zero emissions by 2050. The fact is, Mr Morrison never takes responsibility. He leaves it to others on vaccines, on hospitals, on quarantine, on bushfires, on climate, on renewables. And he's not even in the room when his government's policy on climate and renewables is being decided by Mr Joyce and the Nationals. But when it comes to protecting Mr Porter, that's a job Mr Morrison puts his back into. Well, if only Mr Morrison put the same effort into fighting for the Australian people as he puts into fighting for Christian Porter. Mr Porter. If only he put as much effort into tackling climate change and ensuring we support renewables as he puts into protecting Mr Porter. The whole reason for this government's existence over eight long years has been to stand in the way of action on climate and renewables. And make no mistake about it, any deal that Mr Morrison comes up with now, with Mr Joyce's support, will be nothing but political spin to get Mr Morrison through Glasgow and to get him through the election. But I'd say to the, say to the government, Australians are on to you. Australians are on to you. 
They've seen what Mr Morrison is like and they know he isn't the real deal. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. And I also rise to take note of the answer. Well, it would be too easy, wouldn't it, just to be wearily resigned to the secrecy, the endless and naked politicking from this tired, clapped out government. Because we've had eight years of it, haven't we? Years ago, the government tried hiding the modelling that related to its tax cuts and it hasn't let up since. We've seen relentless rorting. Car parks, sports rorts, all with accompanying colour-coded spreadsheets. And when queried about it, a bullying, uncompromising assertion that this is fine, that this is what government looks like. Yesterday, in the other place, the government voted to protect Mr Porter from scrutiny, an unprecedented decision to shield a sitting government MP from the scrutiny of the Privileges Committee about an unprecedented circumstance where that person sought to establish a legal mechanism to hide his financial interests. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And this morning, this morning here in this place, it's just more of the same, isn't it? We spent hours on this this morning. People remember we're all here in the chamber waiting while these people voted to scuttle an attempt by a member of their own coalition, Senator Canavan, to access important modelling about possible climate commitments and the economic, the economic consequences of those commitments. This government says it's all about the economy. It says it's all about the economic interests of regional Australia. It says it's all about Australia's economic future. But it's not interested in a serious public debate about those questions. It's not interested in a serious debate about our future and, as demonstrated this morning, will do anything possible to prevent such a, play, a debate taking place here in this chamber, here in the very place where such a debate ought to be happening. Because it matters, doesn't it? This kind of secrecy is just wrong and it's reflective of the culture of the government. A relentless pursuit, an unending pursuit of political solutions, of deal making to what are genuine policy problems. And it's all tied up together, isn't it? Because it's easier to do a deal in secret. It's much easier than when there are just a handful of actors in the room a nice little subcommittee of cabinet, just a handful of people who can cut a deal. Cut a deal, shunt money off in one direction in exchange for another kind of commitment that may or may not be in the national interest. And when you cut your deal, it's a lot easier, isn't it, to spin it when there are very few facts about the content of that agreement. Very few facts about the content of the negotiation, very few facts about what has actually been agreed and the consequences for Australia and Australians. Much easier to spin when there aren't facts out there to contradict your narrative. But it's not what the national interest requires. This is a big and serious and consequential challenge. It's one that our peers all around the globe are willing to take on. And around the globe, when we do see serious climate action, it's not the product of secret meetings, some new sort of augmented schedule to the coalition deal between the Liberals and the Nationals. Serious climate action is a consequence of bringing people along. Serious economic reform requires a conversation with the very communities whose lives will change an honest and open conversation that reassures people that you have their interests at heart. Not just making it through, skating through to the next election, keeping your job, keeping your ministry, keeping your cosy spot, keeping your big car. What's needed is a serious public conversation to grapple with an existential challenge and one that every serious country in the world, all of our peers are grappling with at this very moment. Mr Morrison is going to go to Glasgow, he says. 
He should go with a serious plan to take Australia into the future, one that has been the subject of public discussion and the pathetic, endless attempts to reduce this to a grubby deal Thank you, do Senator no McCallus. one any credit. Say your time has expired. Senator Patrick. Oh, sorry, were you seeking the call, Senator Davies? I'll go to Senator Davies and then back to you. Senator Davies. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I rise to speak on, on this motion. Um, I, I believe I want to again draw the attention of the Senate to the response by uh, Senator Zed Zaselja. Uh, a commitment has been made to provide a, a formative response, a more detailed response to the Senate by Friday. The 29th of October, consistent with Standing Order 166, because let me remind you, this OPD was only received yesterday. Deliberations are ongoing. You want us to preempt outcomes of deliberations by releasing modelling that underpins current discussions, current negotiations, and current considerations. I mean, and this is coming from. The Labor Party. Let's not forget, last election, the Labor Party took a commitment for a 45 per cent cut in emissions by 2030 without releasing any modelling, without releasing any costings and without any consideration of what impact that would have on jobs. Jobs, regional communities, farmers, miners and the local bakers and news agents that depend on those jobs for their, their businesses. I, I hear Senator McAllister saying we're doing a deal in secret. Well, we are having very serious discussions because we have been talking to our constituents. We, have taken, we are taking back our constituents' considerations. We don't do deals like the Labor Party in caucus and then foist it upon the Australian public and expect them to fall in line behind us. That's right. And unlike Senator Watt, we actually know who our constituents are. AgForce, which is a Queensland organisation that Senator Watt doesn't even realise is a member of the NFF. Order. Order. The AgForce, who used to run a fantastic campaign. Farmers, every family needs one. So, you know, uh, AgForce are a wonderful organisation, and you should know who they are, Senator Watt. You should understand what they have asked for. Senator Davey, you I remind you to your remarks to the chair, not directly to any senator in the chamber. Thank you. I stand uh, corrected. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy <laughs> President. Um, but I, I'm. Back, back to the important issue at hand. I mean, earlier on, Senator Wong said this government was full of inaction. Inaction. You're talking about a government that has seen massive reductions of emissions since coming into this place and taking on government in 2013 through technology, not taxes, through working in partnership with industry. So instead of hitting industry over the head with a big stick like an ETS or like a carbon tax, we've sat down with industry and we've said, how can we all work together? How can we lower emissions? How can we incentivise innovation? Partnering with the private sector to bring a portfolio of low emissions technology in parity with their current alternatives, working on what is available today, but also with an eye on the future. Because when we're talking about a 2050 target, that is 30 years away. Imagine if we sat down 30 years ago and said, this mobile phone that I have in my handbag today, because it wouldn't fit in my pocket, is going to be the mobile phone we're using in 30 years' time. It is ridiculous to try and cement us into a position what we are doing is laying the foundations for a roadmap, but we're not doing it blindly and we're not doing it deftly. And that is why the Nationals are negotiating. That is why the Nationals are looking at protections to underpin the very jobs and industries that have kept our economy strong through COVID. If it wasn't for our agricultural sector, if it wasn't for our mining sector, if it wasn't for our exports of iron ore and coal and our exports of beef, 
and wheat and rice. In the last year, we've had a, we've had a good rice harvest as well. If it wasn't for those exports, we wouldn't have made it through COVID with the economic strength that we have. We wouldn't be the first country to return to the same number of employed Australians as pre pre COVID. So the nationals. Thank you, Senator Davy. Your time has expired. I indicated before I'd go to Senator Patrick, and then I'll go to you, Senator Roberts. If, yeah, thanks, Senator thank Patrick. You. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note, <coughs> uh, along with uh, my other colleagues. I, uh, I do concede, um, as uh, uh, Senator Davies has uh, indicated, that the letter that has come to the chamber gives some hope that there may be disclosure. Uh, I, <clears throat> I just want to uh, remind the chamber that uh, the position of the Senate has always been, uh, and I've just uh, had a quick look at it just to refresh myself, has always been that it is the deliberations of Cabinet that uh, are accepted as, uh, as being um, uh, a, yeah, the basis of a pro proper public interest immunity claim. Uh, that is the conversations that take place uh, and the Basel reason for that confidentiality is because of a collective responsibility. The ability for ministers to uh, argue across the table and that to be held secret is, is in some sense uh, sacrosanct, and, and I accept that. It doesn't extend to Cabinet documents. The, the Senate has never accepted that. And uh, all too often we see people, uh, uh, see ministers sprinkling the Cabinet secrecy dust over, over things that it shouldn't be... Uh, that it shouldn't be uh, sprinkled over, and I note, I note that at the start of this year, I'm sure, and perhaps in the in the in the finance minister's forty billion dollar discretionary fund, uh, they bought a whole bunch more secrecy dust because they had to extend it to national cabinet. Even though we know national cabinet is not a cabinet, they still they're still definitely sprinkling the cabinet secrecy dust over that. So there is some hope in uh, in in uh, in the letter that has been provided to the Senate, and that's a good thing. I encourage, I, I urge the Prime Minister to release this information and to do so as early as possible because there is a debate that's taking place and debates are always better if they're informed debates. Let's see the modelling, let's see uh, uh, where everything lies uh, rather than having everyone guess. Um, even you know, the, the statements made by the Prime Minister have caused Senator Canavan a member of his own team, a coalition team, uh, uh, doubts, and you know, I, uh, I supported that. I, uh, hence, hence uh, we collectively combined to uh, to move the motion in the first place. Uh, in New Zealand, I just remind senators: in New Zealand, cabinet secrecy doesn't exist. I think there's a, there's something like a 30-day time limit, and then everything's released. You know, uh, you know, unless it's national cabinet or some sorry, if it, unless it's sorry national security. It's released, and their democracy hasn't fallen over. So, you know, maybe it's time that the, that, that our um, uh, parliament st uh, ha starts to consider whether or not we want to move towards adoption of the New Zealand system. It's a responsible system of government, and it seems to manage okay. In fact, I'd argue in many cases does a lot better through the openness and transparency that uh, their cabinet regime offers the New Zealand people. There's an example that we, can, uh, that we should, should adopt there. So uh, whilst you know, I just point out the hard reality is cabinet del deliberations, yes, that's a public interest immunity. Cabinet documents, no, but in any circumstance, the Prime Minister is authorised to release cabinet documents. He did it for the Doherty modelling. Uh, uh, he should also do it for uh, this, uh, this modelling that is the subject of this order. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I take note as well, but I want to, want to discuss more the concerns I have leading up to the government uh, acceding to the Senate's request. I also make note of Senator Patrick's comment then that debates are better if informed, and that's where I want to go to. Senator Birmingham said earlier on today, the government is doing the legwork. Well, if that's the truth, why don't they show it? Why have we gone through this charade for the government to capitulate anyway? 
And then the government mentioned through Senator Birmingham that the government is arguing that Labor they won't do it because Labor won't do it. That's got nothing to do with the, with the issue at all. This issue is about integrity and it goes back at least 20 years. It goes back 25 years. The integrity is shot to bits. And that goes to a fundamental point about this parliament. There is a lack of accountability in this parliament. And the way to change that is to change the parliament. Let me remind people, senators here, of what Senator Ian MacDonald said back in 2016, the last Monday before Christmas. He said that he wanted to congratulate me because I have started the debate on climate science that has never been had in this parliament. Never been had in this parliament. The debate on climate science has never been had. Senator Patrick talks about an informed debate. How can we have an informed debate about the second issue about cutting carbon dioxide when we don't know whether we should cut it? That's fundamental. Mr John Howard, the leader of the Liberal National Howard Anderson government from 1996 through to 2007, enacted the renewable energy target and last year expressed regret for doing so. And he, so he should because it's crippling our industry. He was the first major party leader to have a policy, policy in place for an emissions trading scheme. That, John, that Tony Abbott rightly called a carbon tax. The first leader of, this part of, of a major party in this country with an ETS, an emissions trading scheme, a carbon tax, was John Howard. Now, John Howard enacted all these things, and along with his government, his government stole farmers' property rights to comply with the Kyoto Protocol. That is fact. And he did so, his government did so, by going around the Constitution to avoid Section 51, Clause 31, paying just terms compensation to farmers. And he went through the state governments to do that. So the, so the, so the Howard Anderson Liberal National Government went through the back door deceitfully around the Constitution to steal farmers' property rights. This is about integrity. And then, to cap it off, in 2014, John Howard, speaking at a conference in London, a sceptic conference in London, said that in all this climate science, he is agnostic. He is agnostic. So he put in all these policies, stole hundreds of billions of dollars worth of farmers' property rights, yet didn't have the science. Now, I agree with Senator Waters today, shocked though everyone may be, because she said modelling is crap. And she is absolutely correct. Then she talked about kissing the Great Barrier Reef goodbye, agricultural productivity sliding, Murray-Darling Basin say goodbye. Yet for 773 days, she's refused to provide the empirical scientific evidence that we need to cut carbon dioxide. For 11 years, she's, she's failed to do that. I was, I was a joint panelist with Senator Waters back in 2010, in October. And I challenged her, as a member of the panellists, to I challenged a fellow panellist to debate me on the science, to debate me on the corruption of science. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you because they have not got a position. We hear comments from the Greens about kissing the Great Barrier Reef goodbye. The core premise is that we need to cut carbon dioxide. We have not discussed that in this parliament, ever. And yet we're going to launch into a crusade for... for Trillions of dollars destroying this country. Trillions of dollars worth of opportunity cost. We need to get back to the basics and have a debate about integrity and accountability and let's have the data out and let's start that debate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Scarf. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I say to Senator Roberts, if we stand by, stand back and deny reality, if we deny reality of what is happening in our major trading partners, and I know you've worked in the coal mining industry, uh, and I've done a lot of work in the coal mining industry, as, as, as you know. Um, the reality is, the reality is that, that a lot of those major trading partners that we had, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, who supported the development of our mining industries in Australia, they are moving, 
they are moving towards a net zero uh, emissions policy by 2050. They're moving. They're moving, Madam Deputy President. Uh, to some extent, what Australia does is irrelevant. The world is moving, and it would be it would be wrong of us. It would be wrong of us to deny that reality. It would be wrong of us to deny that reality. Companies like and Senator Roberts will know these companies very well. Companies like Marabeni, companies like Mitsui, companies like Mitsubishi that was part of the BHP is still part of the BHP Mitsubishi Alliance that has developed a lot of the great mines in Queensland in our home state. Companies like POSCO, companies like J Power, they are all moving specifically towards hydrogen. And we can't deny that reality. We will be doing a great disservice a great disservice to our country to deny the reality. And that is the reality. That is the reality. We have to look outwards. We're a trading nation. We have to look outwards and see what is happening in the world. We have that responsibility to do it. We have that responsibility to do it. I remember sitting on a, uh, a Senate Select Committee with Senator Ayres and the AMWU gave uh, evidence which I found particularly compelling, particularly compelling in relation to industries such as the car industry and other heavy manufacturing industry. And the, the repeated theme around the country was when you shut down, when those major industries shut down, when those major industries shut down, the research suggests that a third of workers maybe find full-time work somewhere else, a third of workers go on a, 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 a try go on a repetitious cycle of casual work and part-time work, they never get back into full-time work, and a third of workers maybe never get employed again. We can't let that happen in Australia. We can't let that happen in Australia. We have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to embrace the new technologies and create jobs for Australians. We have to accept the reality of the situation. And those who doubt, those who doubt the future of a hydrogen industry in this country, I say to you, I say to you, look at the economic miracle in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan following World War II. Look at that economic material. Those great nations are focused. They are focused in terms of those new technologies. They're focused on it. We can't lose the opportunity to work with them. If we do, if we do, we will be letting down our communities. The government has been abundantly clear. It is a cornerstone of our policy that there will be no carbon tax. There will be no carbon tax. But what there will be is an embracing of new technologies, and in particular hydrogen. And if you look at the material which has been put out by the Japanese government in particular in terms of the future uh, use of hydrogen in, in Japan, and as you know, Senator Roberts, given your background in the coal mining industry, you know they are our, one of our most successful trading partners in terms of coal mining. If you look at the material being put out by the Japanese Ministry of Economics, their focus is on building a hydrogen industry, and we have to be part of that supply chain. We have to be part of that supply chain. And I say to those who doubt it, I say to those who doubt it, look at the track record of countries like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan and how successful we have been working with them. But we have to work with them. We can't deny their reality, which is there for all to see. We can't deny that reality. We have a moral obligation, a moral obligation to accept the reality of the situation and work constructively forward, embracing the new technologies that will provide further jobs for Queenslanders and for our regions. The opportunity is there. We've got to embrace it, and we've got to embrace it optimistically optimistically. The technology is being developed. We've got to look forward with optimism. There are opportunities there, Madam Deputy President, but we have to have the courage to seize them and make the most of them. Thank you, Senator Scar. If there are no other speakers. Senator Small. Deputy President, uh, we've heard a lot about accountability today. and This is a government that is accountable to the people that matter most, the, the Australian people that sent us here to not only uh, outline our plans before the election, but to stand by them after the election. So we won't be lectured by a Labor Party that had a leader 
that very famously said there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead and promptly implemented uh, such a tax afterwards. So in uh, terms Senator of addressing Small, the issue here Senator today— Senator Small, resume your seat, please, Senator Wong. I know Senator Small may not have noticed the matter we're debating, uh, but the matter relates to a failure by your government to table economic modelling. There is, it is not relevant for the senator to digress to a discussion about what occurred in, I think, 2010. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. So we're debating the order that was returned. Are you seeking a point of order, Senator McKenzie? Well, I would like to contribute to the fact that Senator Wong is saying that uh, Senator, Senator Wong, Smalls— uh, Senator McKenzie, are you on a point of order? If you're not, please resume your seat. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Small. Thank you, because, uh, as you point out, Senator Wong, this debate is about accountability. And accountability to the Australian people matters more than any other. This is a government that protects jobs, keeps the lights on and keeps energy prices lower, quarter on quarter on quarter. So our approach, which we, aligned, uh, we outlined to the Australian people before the last election, was emissions reduction through technology, not taxes. Expanding consumer choice, not restricting it. We will achieve a net zero ambition for this country with incentives, not with penalties. We will partner with the private sector to bring a portfolio of low emission technologies to parity with their Order. current alternatives or better, and Order. consolidating our advantage in affordable and reliable energy Order, whilst being a credible, transparent government accountable to Australians for our progress. So our track record, which uh, is Senator a matter Small, of the public time for record, this debate has expired. Please resume your seat. Order, Senator Wong. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Wong, order. So the question is, the motion moved by Senator Wong to take note of answers be agreed. Order. I am putting the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Wong to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note. Senator Watt. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator McKenzie to the questions asked by me. Uh, and Senator McKenzie, I highly recommend you stick around. Uh, I'll make it worth your while. The, um, well, the week is nearly over in Canberra, and this is a week where we have seen the National Party, the once proud National Party of Black Jack McEwen, a party that once had some principles, some spine, some real leaders that Senator Mackenzie has actually written about, uh, but is now represented in this parliament by a bunch of fakes. We've seen the Nationalist Party spending the entire week performing for the cameras, performing for the media uh, like a bunch of circus clowns uh, and achieving absolutely nothing again for the people of regional Australia. Has there ever been a bigger bunch of fakes in this Australian parliament than the current National Party representatives that we see here? These people in the National Party are such fakes that they make Millie Vanilli look like the definition of authentic. They are so utterly fake, so utterly fake, Senator Davey included, so utterly fake uh, in their fights for regional Australia uh, that we have seen play out over the course of this week. And what's it all about? It's about a plan that the Prime Minister has already stitched up with Barnaby Joyce on behalf of the National Party. Uh, to look like they are doing something about net zero emissions while actually doing absolutely nothing. And as I've said before this week, what we will see from this government at some point over the next week, before the Prime Minister goes to Glasgow, is a fake plan from a fake Prime Minister backed in by fake farmers and fake miners. It is completely and utterly fake. It will be a plan that will not be legislated be because they can't even take it to the Coalition Party room. It will not be legislated. Uh, it will be signed up to by Barnaby Joyce, who has spent his entire political career opposing action on climate change. 
also signed by a Prime Minister who has spent his career opposing climate change action, and yet we are to believe that all of a sudden this Prime Minister has had this road to Damascus conversion and is now a greenie. Well, please, spare me. It is utterly fake. And what we have been able to put to the government in question time, this day, question time today is what real farmers and what real miners have to say about net zero emission. Because we've heard a lot from the fakes in the National Party about their concern about the impact of net zero emissions on farming uh, communities and mining jobs. Uh, but what are actually what are real miners and what do real farmers have to say about net zero emissions? Well, we know that the National Farmers Federation for some time now has been committed to net zero emissions 2050 because they say that is the best way to avoid agricultural exporters uh, avoiding uh, the kind of uh, tariffs that we are going to see from our trading partners and because they understand that farmers, probably more than anyone, need to adjust to a changing climate. We've seen the president of the, of the NFF, Fiona Simpson, say that if the government doesn't sign up to net zero emissions by 2050, that will punish farmers. So that's what real farmers are having to say about this, along with Meat and Livestock Australia, who've actually gone further than the, than the NFF by committing their industry, the meat and livestock industry, to being car carbon neutral by 2030. So fake farmers. What, they, what, what, what real farmers have to say is that we need net zero emissions by 2050, and it's the fake farmers in the National Party who keep saying no. And similarly, what do real miners have to say about net zero emissions? Well, we've seen the Minerals Council of Australia commit to net zero emissions by 2050. We've seen BHP do it. We've seen Rio Tinto do it. And overnight, Rio Tinto has made an even more significant announcement about their commitment to reduce emissions. We've seen APIA, on behalf of the oil and gas industry, commit to net zero emissions, along with Santos, Origin and almost every other resources company in this country. And why? Because they want to make money. They're not greenies. They want to make money. They want to create more jobs, and they know that the way they're going to do it in the resources industry is by committing to net zero emissions by 2050. So we see the real farmers support net zero, while we have the fake farmers in the National Party continuing to oppose it. We see the real miners in this community supporting net zero emissions, while the fake farmers in the National Party continue to oppose it. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen the National Party faking it. They fake it till they make it, every single day they come down here, because these are the people who claim that they care about regional jobs while doing nothing about labour hire and casualisation in mining communities. They do nothing about regional grants going to the cities. They do nothing about spending disaster management funding in regions, you, and they do nothing about health care in the regions. They Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, make some comments uh, about this uh, particular answer. And I think that was a very amusing performance from uh, Senator Watt. I, it's good to know what his definition of a fake farmer is. I have to say, I was, wasn't too sure. I, I mean, it's, look, um, you know, I spent most of my life in regional Australia, so I'm very interested in it. Uh, and it's good to hear the Labor Party is also interested in it because. Uh, there is no question that the, the, the changes that are going to occur in our economy over the next 20 to 30 years uh, will have a disproportionate impact on people living in regional Australia. So I welcome the opportunity to make a few remarks about that. Um, I, I mean, the compelling point is that the wall of money uh, has made up its mind. Uh, global capital markets um, ultimately uh, will not fund fossil fuel investments um, over the long run. Uh, our customers in Asia, uh, their preferences will change, um, and that means that we must respond accordingly. Now, um, the benefit that will come to regional Australia from the transition will be significant. It will be significant in the mining sector, it will be significant in the farming sector, uh, I actually think that a disproportionate impact, positive impact, could accrue to regional Australia as a result of this transition. Now, you think about the, the debate that we have about jobs, which I think is an entirely legitimate one. Uh, there are heavy industry jobs that are in the bush today, uh, in coal and other sectors. And over the long run, those will be replaced with other heavy industry jobs. Uh, there will be offshore wind. There will be hydrogen. Um, there'll be 
there'll be hydroelectric. Uh, these are just energy generating assets and investments that will provide heavy industry jobs in regional Australia. Uh, one of the first major offshore wind developments is in Gippsland in Victoria. And what you're seeing already uh, is workers who were in the coal industry and now working on that offshore wind project, uh, which, is, which are heavy industry, industry jobs. So that is, that is an important, important factor here. And look, the policy of our government will be to have a plan and a target to get to net zero by 2050. And I think that's good. Um, I think it's good to have a target. I think it's good that we can indicate to global capital markets where the country is heading. And I think it's positive that there will be a detailed plan on how that will occur. I think that is a positive thing. Um, I think you will see that the heaviest amount of policy work that has been done on emissions reduction appear over the next few weeks in Australia, ahead of the Glasgow conference. And the great beneficiaries of the bulk of the change over the long run could well be regional Australia. But we have to tell the truth. Uh, and I don't think we should be telling lies to the Australian people about the prospects for different industries over the long run. But it is a long transition. It is a long transition uh, over these next 25 to 30 years. Uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me that the Minerals Council and the Farmers Federation support net zero. It doesn't surprise me at all, because they see the opportunities. Uh, you'll see lithium mining, you'll see copper mining, you'll see carbon abatement services provided by farmers in regional Australia, uh, which could actually include us getting beyond net zero. I think Australia could become an exporter of carbon abatement services, given our large land mass. So I, I think leadership is about telling the truth and identifying pathways through difficult challenges. Uh, this has been an issue which has uh, been caught in a culture war for too long. I've never understood why this issue was part of a, a culture war. I think it's weird. Uh, I'm very pleased that we're coming out of that. Uh, and I think that's good for people who live in regional Australia because, frankly, it will be a, a very expensive transition. And the government is not going to be paying for the transition. Um, a large part of the transition will be coming from the private economy. That will be, and most of it will be foreign capital that will be needed to fund these huge investments. Um, and the people that are building the offshore wind facility in Gippsland um, are not Australian investors. Um, they're Copenhagen investment partners. Um, so like many of these developments across the country, we'll be relying on foreign capital and that's why it's important that we give clear external signals about our direction on this policy. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And I rise to take note of the answer from the um, Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. And, and today, um, you know, we have Senator Bragg's very plain, disconnected from the emotion con contribution to the debate. But this is an issue that actually matters to people. It's intimately entwined with their life. And there can be no clearer indication that the National Power Party stands for absolutely nothing and have no real connection to the reality and is in terminal decline than the answers from the minister that we received today. The party that began as one that was by regional Australia and for regional Australia has become something else entirely. Detached from the major rural industries, many members of the current National Party have become a party, really, of right-wing grievance, fighting culture wars instead of standing up for rural and regional Australians. It's a performance for some of them. Senator Canavan, a former KPMG and Productivity Commission economist and a political staffer, parades about in high vis like he's, never, he's, he, like he's worked a day or worked his whole life in a blue-collar industry. Not the truth. We even see George Christensen, the departing member for Dawson, spending more of his time on culture war crusades, appearing on far-right podcasts next to neo-Nazis at rallies and doing his utmost to under undermine Australia's vaccine drive. He does all of that rather than standing up and speaking up for rural and regional communities who can't get in to see a GP, who haven't got adequate housing, who have been described in this chamber this week by the Nationals as the most marginalised and poverty-stricken communities of this country. That's what 75 years of the Nationals have delivered, and they are absolutely failing at the moment. 
In the last three years, the National Party has had two members leave their party room to sit on the crossbench, one over its coup culture and its most recently uh, former uh, minister, Darren Chester, who slammed what he called an extreme white right push in the party by certain members. Australia needs a government that has a plan to address climate change. And instead of a plan, we have had eight years of backstabbing and political infighting driven by this hard right rump of the party room. The Liberal National Coalition is a party at war with itself. And that is on display for everyone to see this week. The Nationals have no vision. They're disconnected from the reality of the lives of the people they purport to represent. Their myopic vision for Australia is for us to be an international pariah and to miss the opportunity to capitalise on a chance to reinvigorate our heavy industry sector with cheap green energy. But why? Why do they continue in this vein? Who do the Nationals really stand for? Well, they don't stand for miners. As much as they come in here and bleat and moan to us that they actually do, they are new friends to the miners. They did not stand with them, and they have overseen rampant casualisation and the increase of insecure work for mining across this country. They don't stand for farmers either. Farmers are at the forefront of the fight against climate change. They live it every day. It affects their bank balance. It affects their family. It affects their community. They know better than anyone else what violent increases in weather events have done. There are stories on the Darling of people trying to pump water back into the river using that precious <coughs> asset to try and save some of the fish deaths that were seen right across this country taking money out of their pockets literally to put it in the environment to try and save to try and save some of the fish in the environment that they care for that's who the real farmers of australia are intimately connected with the land that they work instead we have here the national party who are increasingly dictated to by the echo chamber of far right media outlets and we have the National Party telling their voters an easy lie rather than the hard truth and attempting to prop up their moribund political party by fighting a desperate rearguard action against Australia's efforts to fight climate change. This National Party are out of step with the global community. They're out of step with their own supposed community in the regions of Australia. They are time limited. They simply cannot connect themselves to a future for this country and for the people they claim to represent. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Senator Small. Thanks, Deputy President. And we come in here today for another sermon and another lecture from the Labor Party about real farmers and fake farmers, real miners and fake miners. Now, notwithstanding that there's no such thing to the people of the Morrison government who understand that Australian industry is imperative to the hundreds of thousands, indeed millions, of Australians who depend on those industries for jobs. But we don't have the hide to say one thing before an election and then slap those same people with a big tax afterwards. Not just the carbon tax, which we discussed a little earlier today, but indeed the Labor Party, last time they were in government, was the party of the mining tax. So indeed the Morrison government and the senators here on this side of the chamber will not be lectured by the Labor Party on this. As they pitch to defend themselves against attacks from Greens to the left on the political spectrum, they talk about being disconnected from the Australian people. Well, those same Australian people here sent us here at the last election because we stood by our plan for technology, not taxes, to not only lower Australia's emissions but allow Australia to export lower emissions technology to the entire world. Our track record on this speaks for itself. Uh, emissions 20.8 per cent below 2005 levels. We beat our Kyoto era target by 459 million tonnes. For context, that's the equivalent to taking every car in Australia off the road for a decade. We didn't do it with a carbon tax. We didn't do it with some surprise that we lobbed on the Australian people after the election, we did it with a clear plan and an ambition. And then we set about working in this place, partnering with industry, embracing technology to deliver it. And that is what people expect of a government here in Australia. 
That is what, when you're not disconnected from the Australian people, you understand. So whilst emissions are lower than at any year during the previous Labor government, they're also at the lowest levels since 1990. Now that matters to some people. But the thing that matters to Australian businesses out there, particularly those in the heavy manufacturing sector to which Senator O'Neill referred, is the power prices have in fact fallen for 10 consecutive quarters. Year on year, that's 19 months in a row of electricity price reductions here in Australia. 48 per cent lower uh, than, than the, uh, sorry, um, 23 consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year increases in household prices was the track record of this government. So, uh, so the, the, the Labor government, I, I apologise. Our record, 10 consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI reductions in retail power, the Labor Party's record, not only a carbon tax, not only a mining tax, but also 23 consecutive quarters, year-on-year -year increases in household electricity costs, and they have the hide to come in here and lecture us. Well, the Australian people can see straight through that, and they understand that this is the same old Labor, because recently we've seen the Labor Party put their dirty little secret out there into the public. Asked on Sunday by David Spears, Senator Gallagher has said, and I quote, we are looking at everything. That was in response to a direct question Senator as to whether Small, or not a carbon tax— Senator Small, I will remind you of the question. It was a question um, from Senator Watt to Senator McKenzie, and it was largely around net zero emissions by 2050, comments made by Fiona Sampson and the Mineral Councils of Australia. So you were on track, but you have well and truly strayed over the last <laughs> minute or so. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I'm delighted to return to talking about the Morrison government's plan to achieve net zero with technology, not taxes, because that is the ironclad guarantee that the Prime Minister has given the people of Australia. There is no plan uh, from the Morrison government that includes a carbon <coughs> tax. Not only not uh, a carbon tax, but in fact, no penalties. Because we have been clear with the Australian people that we will achieve net zero emissions with technology, not taxes, with choice, not constraint, with incentive, not penalty, and we will deliver it in partnership with the private sector. The private sector that generates the jobs that Australians depend on, the private sector that will export new energy technology to the world. That is what this government is about. So we are delighted to stand on our track record. We put our plans to the Australian people each election, and that is the accountability that matters. Before the next election, the Prime Minister has been clear that we will, in fact, have a very clear plan for the Australian people. It will be costed, it will be achievable, and it will be based on the outcomes that we have delivered. The Labor Party's plan, which doesn't exist, includes a legislated target, which is a blank cheque. A blank cheque, a carbon tax on the table, and I think I know who the Australian people will trust. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Ayres. Well, enough uh, from the junior burger from Bunbury. The um, Prime Senator Minister said. Ayres. Senator Ayres, I ask you to withdraw that I'll and refer that. to the centre by his correct name. The, 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 the Prime Minister said. The Prime Minister said, if you have a go, he said, you'll get a go. Well, this is the Prime Minister's 21st go. He's 21st go over eight years at getting climate and energy policy right. And we're seeing the consequences, just like a kid who campaigns against the HSC for all of their period in high school and then suddenly starts studying for the exam in the last two days. This Prime Minister, this coalition, is falling apart at the Glasgow hurdle. And now we've got the Glasgow gaslighting show a pantomime that's been constructed to try and get the Prime Minister through the next two weeks and then through to the election. It is the worst pantomime in Australian theatrical history with the least compelling cast. It has some problems, this shift to net zero from the Prime Minister. Like Mr Morrison, it is fake. Like Mr Morrison, it is a fraud. And like Mr Morrison, 
it is all marketing and no substance because he is a man who believes in nothing. There is zero credibility for this switch to net zero. And in the review of this pantomime, let's deal with problem one, the National Party. Plot credibility for this pantomime requires that they pretend to fight for some regional interest. So the farmers for the squatters and the pastoralists that's decayed and deteriorated to a bunch of jumped up bunyip aristocracy who fight for property developers and real estate agents, water speculators and spivs, couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. That's the problem. This whole plot rests on the idea that the National Party could fight and they couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. I wish we had some heavy hitters. There's no Reg Withers, there's no Doug Anthony, there's no Peter Nixon, there's no Ian Sinclair. When you look at them, when you look at them, what a bunch of pathetic specimens. Senator Canavan, he wouldn't make an impression on a feather bed. Former KPMG guy, former pseudo-economist, ministerial staffer, dresses up in the high vis and puts the makeup on and pretends to be a coal miner. Senator McKenzie, well, all we've seen is whinging and whining and backstabbing and leaking and moaning, but we haven't seen any fighting and we haven't seen any delivery. The best way you can assess future performance is, of course, past performance. And, of course, the only thing that we have seen for a policy proposal from this decaying carcass of a once great political party is Minister Pitt, who proposed a $250 billion line of credit, $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia of public money that would be allocated to an industry that doesn't want it. And Senator Canavan, who's got enough memory of Economics 101, told us that it would, have, it would have such a distortionary effect on the Australian economy that it would put up interest rates. And he said that was a good thing. Lifting mortgage costs, lifting business costs, pushing jobs overseas. Well, that's what we've had from the National Party. Problem two, of course, is the Prime Minister, who's a fraud, a phony, a fake. He wants to say one thing in Glasgow, another thing in Gunnedah, and something entirely different in Glen Waverley. He wants a credible position for Glasgow, and he wants to go and say something completely different in Gladstone. And then he'll sneak back to Sydney and try and convey to people in New South Wales that he's got a serious message on climate change in George's Hall. You can't spend 10 years sucking up to climate sceptics and science deniers and cranks and then expect that you can execute a complete U-turn on climate and energy policy. How many jobs has this cost? How much has it cost ordinary families? Well, this is a fraud, a Thank phony you, and a fake, Ayers. and it's been seen for what it is. So the question is, the motion is to move by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer by Minister Rustin to my question. Um, this week is anti-poverty week, and you would have thought that the government might have tried to sound a bit sympathetic this week to people who are caught up in the whirlpool of poverty. But no. Not only couldn't Minister Rustin bring herself to condemn the appalling words of former New South Wales Liberal Minister Prue Goward, Minister Rustin doubled down. Um. Oh, although saying that the government was very concerned about vulnerable people, when it came to the crunch, she could not even bring herself to state the bleeding obvious that the job seeker rate of $44 a day is totally in inadequate and it condemns people to be living abject lives of poverty. Balance she said it was all about. Balance. We can't have income support that's too generous, otherwise people won't have the incentive to go out and get a job. Read 
we have to make you desperate enough to try and get work that more than likely is going to be under, underpaid, more than likely is going to exploit you, more than likely is going to be totally insecure and or dangerous. That's what this balance is all about. I mean, her uncaring answer just made me furious. It reflected the uncaring brutality of this government that, frankly, do not care that over a million people are living in poverty in Australia. It made me furious, but I've got a well-paid job. And in listening to her answer, I wondered, I mean, how would people living in poverty on JobSeeker how would they feel about how their government feels about them? I'm mean, thinking about the people that I've recently spoken with. I've had the community affairs portfolio now since Senator Seawitt resigned for just over a month. And I've taken the opportunity to reach out to a whole lot of people, a whole lot of organisations and a whole lot of people. I'm thinking about Isabel. Isabel's a 26-year-old trans woman living in Brisbane on JobSeeker. I mean, she told me she lives in chronic pain, cannot spend lots of time standing, which makes it extremely difficult for her to work. She also lives with severe mental health issues, which have been exacerbated by stress and social isolation caused by relying on JobSeeker. And she told me that being on JobSeeker makes you feel like you're disgusting and reviled. If you can't pay a bill, people look at you like you spat on their face. The narrative around JobSeeker is constructed in a way that tells people you want to be poor. And when I asked Isabel what it was like to find secure housing on the JobSeeker payment, she said that as a trans woman it was scary. She said that as a trans woman I need to be in a place where I'm safe from po possible victimisation. I need to reduce my risk of victimisation. I need to find places I can afford but places that are queer friendly. And she fears that if she ever had to move out of where she currently lives, there would be very limited options that are both safe and affordable. I mean, this is unacceptable. The answer to my question today was basically demonising people like Isabel by this government. Isabel should be able to find a safe place to live as a trans, a trans woman. And then when I asked Isabel what it was like receiving the COVID supplement last year, when the job seeker rate was doubled, she said, when it started, the impact on my general well-being, essentially, at the same time as I was realising I was trans, it gave me the ability to get through a healthcare system that is not just institutionally gate-kept, but also financially gate-kept. I had freedom. I didn't think they would drop us back into hell, but they very slowly did over a few months. She told me, on $80 a day, realistically, I could probably fix my life. The distance from where I am now to where I need to be could be reduced, but on the, at the moment, on the current rate, it is unconquerable. It's people like Isabel that I really feel for, who on hearing Minister Rustin's answer to my question today would just felt like it was a kick in the guts, to just feel this government is uncaring, brutally uncaring, does not have any empathy at all for what they are going through. Well, what I want to say to Isabel and the millions of people who are surviving in poverty on JobSeeker is, yep, this government is not listening. We've got to kick them out. But I hear you. The Greens hear you. We know that $44 a day is a pittance, and we know we need to raise the rate for good. And to do that, we are going to have to turf out this uncaring, heartless government out of office in order to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. The question before the chair is that the Senate take note of the answer by Senator Rustin to the question of Senator Rice's. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Uh, 